You know what I just thought of? What? We need a couple more sounds on our soundboard. Yeah, we do. We need the... <laughs> <laughs> just, it's an obvious the siren to have that. Yeah. yeah. Can we put a vavuzula? What is a vavuzula? <laughs> Why do you do this to me? Do you, do you remember... There's a reason people think that you're the smart guy. You are, number one, but, first and foremost, but you do this to me. Yeah. Raise your hand out there if you've ever heard of a vavuzula. Of course they have. Did you watch the World Cup and they all had those long horns? Oh, yeah. And then yeah. they got banned from football? Oh, I didn't know that. But. They got banned because they were so annoying. That's a vavuzula. Okay. Like the long... Burr, 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 burr. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's a, you gotta have that at a soccer game. Yeah, but they're banned. So, this is now episode three of the video pod. 46 in total. 46. On the record. It's gonna be the best one yet. Not likely. (laughs) Each of us came in from a trip. We both independently traveled to the same town, right? Yeah. This week. Yep. We had two different sales guys that had booked enough meetings that we were both required. Yeah. So we were in Northern California, San Jose area, Santa Clara. I went up to San Francisco and it was a good trip. What did you do? Who did you see and what did you learn? All right. So we visited a few different places. One is an electric car vehicle company in Northern California. Okay. (laughs) And not a, as opposed to a truck vehicle? Yeah, no no trucks. Okay. And uh, so we toured their facility, which I'd been there before, but we had a few more people on this trip and talked to them about their additive initiatives. In that particular facility, they have some SLS machines, FDM machines, DLP machines, and they're rapidly expanding. Start to talk to, to them a little bit about each of those. We went to a large keyboard and mouse manufacturer and uh, talked more polyjet. Interesting thing about this visit and just the 3D printing initiatives there is that with everyone still working from home, the design process and the demand for printed parts is like 10 or 20x because you have a group of say 100 design engineers that all have a need for input. And instead of printing one part, and then you take it to the meeting and and everybody looks at it and shares their feedback, you have to print 20 parts and then ship them to their homes. Wild, huh? That that makes me think about the fact that there's a ton of engineers on all these teams. We also visited an automotive manufacturer of a different type more automated okay. let's say and like self-driving i'll just say if, it's if, if. it's it's more automated <laughs> okay okay <laughs> anyway they, when we when we're driving around downtown san francisco i actually can't keep track of how many self-driving vehicles are on the road really i didn't even notice one Really? Mm-hmm. There's been there were times where I saw two or three in a row. I wasn't paying attention. They have passengers, but they have all the equipment on the vehicles. Okay, I've seen a the couple lidar of those, like the and test, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Test vehicles. Oh my goodness! That reminds me of my YouTube of the day. Oh, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna. You're gonna jump right into no, it. No, no, no. I'm not. I actually, while you talk, while you go off on one of your monologues, I'm gonna go find it. I don't have monologues. What are you talking about? I'm going to go find it, and then I'll I'll uh, implant it into this episode. <laughs> okay. It's, it'll it's be strange very, phrasing. <laughs> it'll be very organic. Um, but no, getting back to the number of engineers that are yeah. at these places, we had some discussion with them, and, and the, the guys that we had a discussion with were kind of the print lab owners. Yeah. There's right. four, four people in there that are basically creating all these parts for the engineers. So they're not engineers themselves. And he was telling us like, yeah, we have X amount of engineers. We're going to double that Mm -hmm. in the next year. Our goal is to double it. Why 
We heard this. Why do these companies have goals to grow the company? And not just in just like in general. Yeah, the company. Like they they're like, oh yeah, we have and and I'm this number is not the number, but we have five hundred employees. We want to have a thousand by fall. We want to have two thousand by by next year. You know why that is? Well, sort of. Like for one, companies need to grow. They they have Is that how they show growth? Well, how do you, how do you grow? Like you can set a goal. I want we want to double our revenue in five years. Say that would be kind of a typical growth target. So yeah. we want to double our revenue. Okay. Well, how do we do that? And we just make a company twice as big. Increasing the size of the company is a component of that. Is it what's the ratio? It's going to be different for everyone. But you would say, how do we do that? Well. Perhaps we could double the number of products that we output, right? Or increase the sales. Or you have these different vectors for growth, and a lot of them include more manpower, right? On the design side, or on the distribution side, or on the production side. And so you, if, especially if you're a larger company where you have already a, a lot of employees and you already have a long history of growth, you could predict hey, we know that if we're going to see 30% growth, that means we're going to have to grow our design department by 10%, something like that. Make sense? I suppose. It but companies do have to grow. Organic. The same way uh, com- nations have to grow. Like, Imagine that's the whole idea of uh, like a recession, negative growth, but you still have to grow. You have to grow because everything becomes more expensive. You have to open up new opportunities to employees. A company that's not growing is dying. I get that. I just, it, it's interesting for me to be like, we are planning to have X amount of people yeah. and not, hey, this project demands X amount of people. Yeah. Or we have the need for these people because X, Y, and Z. And it, it seems like the number of people are the target, not the throughput or output, I guess. Yeah, it's maybe just a different way of framing the growth. It's weird. Well, yeah. but I, if, if you're managing a I'm team, not a businessman. That's every, why I'm here. Everyone, you could have the same target and then everyone down the chain may have their own way of framing that target. Right? I suppose. Like think about with our printers, we may have a target for how many printers do we want to sell a year? And you that could come in a dollar amount. It could come in a printer count amount. And you could be talking about the same thing, just different ways of getting there. It seems weird. I'm, I'm not yeah. going to change my mind on the fact that yeah. it seems weird. I'm not going to try to convince you. To, to phrase either. it that way. But that was a theme that I noticed too. Everyone's talking about growth, although... Most people were still working from home. So we saw entire rooms of empty workstations, but they're still pumping out a lot of product. Yeah. I feel bad a little bit for these technicians, let's call them, these print yeah. technicians, because they're hiring engineers with all kinds of different experience, uh-huh. experience levels or exposure to 3D printing. And these guys are just and girls are asking a lot for sure of you know these say four individuals at this place and it's their job to kind of sell to like internally to their organization the capability that they have in house and kind of kind of training and some of these engineers don't even know that the print labs exist mm-hmm. and they're outsourcing parts mm-hmm. um, and they have been for years yeah it's like oh we had an f900 yeah. Never knew. What can that printer do again? I would I would say that's another theme of our visits this week was communicating to these shop owners like what is your process internally for for uh, part requests and part delivery and how do you increase the awareness of the print lab capabilities within your organization and just communicating those cap- capabilities and that's something that we can help with, right? Like part of what we do is go on site and hold seminars and, and things like that to just kind of 
spread awareness, proselytize. Yeah. Through I'm, printing. I'm with you there. Evangelize. Evangelize. I, mm. that, I knew that was the word you were looking for. Yeah. That's a word that um, sometime around the mid 2010s became a legitimate title for some people. I'm, I'm an evangelist. A 3D printing evangelist? Yeah. Or an additive manufacturing I'm an evangelist. evangelist? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else that stood out for you on your trips? Well, we so we went downtown San Francisco, and we visited a place that I've been wanting to visit for quite a while, and that is the Pier 9 uh, uh, location of Autodesk, Autodesk Pier 9, which is an awesome uh, manufacturing facility. It is so cool. Yeah, you were telling me a little bit about it. Like, I, I didn't want to ask too much because I was hoping yeah. to learn some here. Like, what are the tools? What are the things? You said they had access to. So basically. this is a company that I'm I'm comfortable talking about because they're they're heavy on social media and their that facility in particular exists to spread awareness about their existence. You could think of it as an incubator, although they never use the word incubator. They use the word like residence, but they basically bring people in and help them start companies. But the facility also exists to experiment, and it's almost like a center of excellence for manufacturing tools. And they're shifting a little bit away from like a maker-oriented uh, mission to more manufacturing-oriented mission. But they have they have a wood shop, they have a fabrication shop, they have a machine shop, they have a robotic shop, and it's cool because all of the software developers are in and out of there, and you have people like us whose whole job is to just know and learn the tools. So they had some cool tools. They're making room for a new hybrid machine, a Mazak uh, hybrid CEC, uh, CNC and BED machine. And they have a Metsura 5-axis machine. They have some Haas machines that they just set up uh, robots on, mechanic robots in front of. They had a new Renishaw equator, which is like a, it's strange. It's, it's a Delta style CMM, but Renishaw doesn't say it's a CMM because that Delta style movement. Tell, tell our listeners what a CMM is if they don't already know. It's a, you tell them. It's a coordinate measuring uh, machine. It's a probe. Yeah. It's a big old probe. It's used to verify dimensions, right? So if you had a part like this and you say, I want this to be two inches by two inches, you have to measure it somehow. And if you're measuring a lot, you might have an automated tool that comes and touches it. And uh, they're very precise. So it's an inspection device. It's also a reverse engineering device. It can it's... be used in a lot of ways. Okay. Yeah. CMMs are amazing because if you're, if you're measuring something, the precision of the machine should be at least an order of magnitude greater than what you're measuring. Yeah. They're cool. I've, I've used one once. Yeah. I had access at a past job. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, it was fun. The This new machine from Renishaw is a Delta style machine. So a lot of people are probably familiar with Delta style 3D printers. It's where it's like... I know what you're talking about. I think it's called... It's, a, the, it's the three arms, right? Yeah. And then it kind of... Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's downward. called a Stewart platform if it's upside down. So imagine like a flight simulator that it has six axes of movement. I think it's called a Stewart platform. Are you fact-checking me? No, I'm not fact-checking. I just, you know. I uh, welcome any and all fact-checks. But I'm actually 50% confident in this one. Stewart platform. Anyway, they're not quite as precise as just a standard linear uh, axis type of movement just with ball screws or belt drives or something like that. And so they know that it's a less accurate CMM. So they kind of pitch it as a shop floor gauging tool, not so much a, a final inspection CMM tool. So that was cool. They have some robotic arms there for development. Uh, and they had quite a few DED parts that were printed with robotic arms. So imagine just like a MIG welder on the, did you, what'd you find? Nothing. What'd nothing, you find? Nothing. I just had a thought when you were talking about MIG welding. 
Go ahead. And 3D printing. Did you look up Stuart I, Popcorn? Yeah, I did. You were right. You were right. Yes. Yeah, you were dead dead on. Cool. I wasn't cool. fact checking you, by the no, way. No, I, I I wish you would. No, because I like to see. I needed validation for myself to see that a Stuart platform was that what I thought it was. Yeah. I can't have tension, you thinking that I'm tension. That I'm doing that to you. No. I would never. Tension's good for the pod. <laughs> Especially now that we're on video, oh, we need some drama. We've got drama. I've watched enough TV to know that you need drama. Oh yeah, it keeps the people hooked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know, I'm someday. So you're trying some, to create. Yeah. Fact check me. Fact check me, bro. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> nice try. Uh, you're just too passive. And here I am being too exactly. Passive. Here I am being all passive. So Pier Nine was an awesome visit, and it's literally on a pier. You told me that they had a technology there. That was kind of a dud. Are 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 we able? To, <laughs> well, we can't talk about it, can we? No. It's a large format machine. Yeah. That is not a Stratasys system, and probably can't. Like, I don't think there is a Stratasys system that's that big anyhow. So it's not like a direct mm, competitor in that aspect. Pretty close. Mm. Pretty close. I'm not gonna say it's a dud. I I'm will. just gonna say that they haven't been very successful with it but uh so diplomatic for someone who doesn't want to create or does want to create drama yeah here you are just i want this later yeah you know passively <laughs> you, you got me he's a true professional you got me look what he came with today look what he came with notes again i want everyone to know <laughs> to know that tyler never created a note before we were on film never he's a he knows what he's doing. It's numbers. I'm not going to memorize. I want to get into that. I'm not going to memorize I'm all excited. these numbers. And yes, it is written in purple. That's nice. Is that the, to spread any sort of awareness or is there a reason behind the purple? Yeah, there is a reason. Um, but it's just uh, it's a secret reason. Okay. <laughs> Don't want to share it with the group. If you know, you know. <laughs> okay. That's going to mess up with our levels. My little laugh there. I apologize. <laughs> um, anything else about the trip? No. That stood out? No. It was a good trip. It was a good trip. Nice weather out there. It's good to see. Uh, it was our first flight that we didn't have to wear masks if we didn't want to. We did need vac vaccination records everywhere we visited yeah. in Northern California, uh, which is was kind of a different. But, you know, officially, it's, it's Fauci official now. That COVID's over. Is that right? Yeah. As Big of, news. As of this you heard it here first. Yeah. Well, probably heard probably it here not. Second. You heard it here <laughs> yeah. second. <laughs> you heard it here. Yeah. Everyone's ready to get back in. And you're starting to see people trickle into the office. That was kind of the feedback. Like you have people coming in once a week, twice a week, you know, get more and more. It was refreshing. I think people there are happy about it. Everyone was so eager to show show off the tools that they had collected over the last couple of years and yeah, it was good. It was a fun trip. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so what do we got cooking here? <laughs> we have something fun. Okay. We have something fun. Remember how we told everyone we would never advertise? Oh, yeah. We're really going to pad our pockets with this one. <laughs> I got an advertisement. Okay. This is fresh in. Fresh in. For you, print heads. Are we going to tag team this? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to start or do you want you to start? You can start. Okay. I haven't actually read it yet. Oh, you haven't? That, no, that'll be you even more start. fun. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the Material Minute. And okay. this is the official sponsor. The official of the sponsor material minute. of the Material Minute. Okay. And I have a script for the Material Minute. Oh, wow. But we'll get into that. After last week, you needed it. <laughs> I went back and watched the video. Was it bad? Was it bad? Oh, my gosh. And it was no. like... Oh, Don't, it let's was... not talk about it. Okay, let's go. Was it cringeworthy? No, it wasn't cringeworthy. It was just nowhere near a minute. Well, this one should be well under a minute. Okay. I think. So is it material under a minute? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it's a material minute. And today it's brought to you by <laughs> Juicy Filaments. Juicy Filaments. Okay. Hey, print heads. <laughs> Are your FPM parts lacking that glossy luster? Do friends and colleagues give your parts the stink eye? Have you ever thought about hanging up your calipers because additive manufacturing, 3D printing, might not be your forte, don't give up, get juicy. Yes, run, 
Don't walk to your nearest filament provider and purchase Juicy Filaments today. Juicy Filaments are guaranteed to provide the most radiant prints, and our 2022 spring colors are available now, while supplies last. Be the first one in your makerspace to print with Eggplant Parmesan, our Royal Plum PLA with Ectospasmic Silver Flex. <laughs> Backwoods Bayou blended ABS for all your camouflage needs. And finally, our best blend yet, Water World. <laughs> our juiciest oceanic PLAs have been meticulously hand-woven into dramatic wave-crashing hues. Juicy filaments are manufactured with state-of-the-art positronic reverse helical filament winding spindles in our juicy labs. Each juicy filament comes sealed in telaxial coated hyperbaric reusable satchels to preserve its effective juicy elements. I can't believe you aren't ordering juicy filaments right now. And they, <laughs> thank you for sponsoring the Material Minute Juicy Filaments. Um, so if you couldn't tell, that's that's all fake. That's all fake. That was just for longtime fun. listeners will understand juicy filaments. What do we call longtime listeners? Printheads. That's right. Which is thank you to the writers of the juicy filaments ad reads. Yes. Printheads. We really appreciate okay, it. Okay, what's our material minute? Material minute today. Yeah. Are you ready? I am ready. You wanna start a stopwatch for me to make sure I actually oh I can I can see. Go. <laughs> ASA. Uh, will you hurry and tell us what ASA stands for? No. Acryl and nitrile styrene acrylate. Okay. That is the toughest one for me to remember. It's an all-purpose prototyping material with exceptional UV stability, especially suited in production parts for outdoor, commercial, and infrastructure use. ASA won't degrade with prolonged outdoor use and is accurate, stable, and very durable. Z-strength ratio is 91% as compared to 87% with ABS. Mechanical properties are almost identical across the board. The end. That's it? That was like 15 seconds of actual material information. I could have slowed it down. You should have. ASA is a great material. We really like it. Comes with a matte finish. Wow. No. Too short? Okay, well, I'm going to time this out better next time. Yeah, you, you're, <laughs> Another you're kind of doing this. <laughs> An overcorrection? Yeah. Okay. You'll get it. All You'll right. get it. That was good information, though. It's UV stable. Yes. And it... What's the anisotropy ratio? 91%. 91%. Uh, yes. I would say it's Actually, 90%. Wait, what? You want 90%. Oh, my. Okay, well, according to Stratasys, this is how they lay it out. Z-strength ratio is 91%. Please, will okay. you tell us how that works? You explained it to me earlier. Made sense. This is what you're good at. Let's hear it. Super okay. Power boy. So what you would want to do is, let's say you're talking about tensile strength. Take the lower number of tensile strength, which is usually upright in the Z direction. Divide that by the flat direction, tensile strength. And then you do one minus that. So one minus parenthesis upper over lower and parenthesis. That gives you the percentage of anisotropy, which would be 9%. Which is very important. Uh, an important thing to consider with really any 3D printing technology, but particularly FEM, right? Yeah. And most material suppliers will give you that in their material data sheets. So the reason why this is fresh on my mind is because I was reading some journals this morning and I came across an article on reducing anisotropy of a part fabricated by material extrusion via warm isostatic pressure. So on the metal world, we talk, we have talked about hipping. Do you remember this? HIP, hot isostatic pressing or pressure. And it is a post-processing procedure that you would use to try to reduce the porosity in a metal part and increase the overall strength and reduce the anisotropy. But it's expensive. It takes huge equipment to do it. And what caught my attention was they were talking about warm isostatic pressure. And I was like, ooh, could this be approachable? Uh, it's not. It's still not approachable. Okay. So a warm isostatic pressure in this case was uh, a, a two-step thing, annealing, and then the, the whip, the whipping process, 
warm isostatic resin. It includes some heat and pressure. And that's where I was like, is the pressure going to be low? It's not. It's like 100 bar, which is about 1400 PSI. And the annealing process was at 130C, which is 266F. But anyway, here's the process. Okay, just annealing and just annealing FDM, which we know and understand. So the way that these guys did it is they vacuum bag the parts and then they hit them with uh, 266 degree Fahrenheit uh, temperature, ramped up fast for an hour, and then they let them cool over a 24 hour period. So in the horizontal plane, they annealing it, they saw a 1.4% increase in tensile strength. So in the horizontal plane, not a big difference. Although if you look at the anisotropy, it reduced from 41% down to 14%. Because the upright uh, strength in the Z direction increased 32%. And the anisotropy went down, if for so for a part printed upright, the total anisotropy was 11% versus about 30%. So annealing... What material were they using? Uh, this was P430, which is an old ABS material from Stratasys. Okay. It was printed on a Fortis uh, 250, so an older machine. The toughness increased 30% in the horizontal position and 190% in the vertical position. So that's just annealing. So it's pretty significant. It That's the, major. The annealing process improved the anisotropy or reduced the anisotropy significantly. Once you included the pressure, everything got even better. Uh, the For something printed flat, the anisotropy reduced to 3% after warm isostatic pressing. Pretty, pretty insane, huh? <laughs> Toughness on the upright part increased 600%. What? 600%. Wow. On the toughness. So this came out of Korea. I thought that was a pretty interesting article to put some numbers to. Let me ask you something. Yeah. Because while that's all really impressive actually do you think people are willing to adopt that type of post-processing or some. are they just likely to look for a new technology some i would say if you're prototyping you're not going to go through this so is it our job to spread awareness that this is possible yeah that's what we're doing <laughs> that's what we're doing it is it is when we speak people listen at least five or six people <laughs> At uh, least five and six. And hey. they're all named Jeb. <laughs> yeah, they're all employees of Go Engineer. Yeah, they're all named Jeb. I, I, I honestly, I really like this. I actually had some discussions with a customer. So now going back to, this was one of the autonomous vehicle customers that we mm -hmm. went and spoke with. They were having some challenges with some parts, just some of the small cross-sectional areas. Uh, think of like a clip Yeah. that okay. has to, a hinge of some sort. It, they were having breakage issues and the cross-sectional area was just tiny. And I said, well, if you can orient the part on an angle that increases your cross-sectional area on that portion, it might be just enough to help. But I wonder if this procedure would yeah. have been something I should have talked about. So the annealing process is really approachable. You, I could picture us doing that in the lab here really mm -hmm. easily. We have a, now you don't even have to vacuum it. That's, this is actually the first time I've seen someone vacuum bag it. We've talked in the past about putting it in a salt or a sand or some inert. Can you put it in water? You can do a Maybe. water annual on, on nylon, I believe. Well, yeah, you can, but they're really just going after the heat in that case. Long story short, yeah, you, you, you want to heat it and you want to try to, uh, uh, you want to try to give it a stable environment so that it's not moving on you in a weird way. So water could do that. Vacuum bagging, salt, sand, you know, M&Ms maybe. And that way you heat up the M&Ms, the inside mounts, the hard <laughs> oh shell still gosh. there. And you Did just, you write that joke in? No. Tell me you didn't write that no, down. No, I left some, I left a bag of M&Ms <laughs> in uh, the car in Northern California. And like I came out of the meeting and they were kind of warm and I popped them out, but Melt in your mouth, not in your hands. This is so good. 
That's a that's a little sideways advertisement. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's approachable. 266 Fahrenheit, that's easy. You could do that in a kitchen oven. Mm-hmm. Easy. 1400 PSI, that's not. Oh, yeah. With the pressure. The, but with the pressure, that's not approachable. That's just an additional step. Equipment. Yeah. You could do this with just heat and see positive That's results. annealing. Now, annealing is not going to significantly affect the porosity of the part. So you saw uh, better adhesion between the layers. Ooh, okay. So did they talk about shrink rate at all? No, because no, they didn't. I would imagine the part is slightly smaller. I would guess yes. For displacing the dead space. Yeah. It's got to be filled up with something. Yeah. I would guess yes. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't. I, I couldn't quantify that. Couldn't quantify and that. And they didn't, is what you're saying. Uh, not that I saw. I mean, you can't expect me to read every single word oh, in this. Okay. All right. So you didn't actually peruse the document. I absolutely perused the document. I didn't per- scour the document. That's what peruse means. No. Commonly mis mis uh, fact check me. misused. Fact check me. I already know this. Fact one. check me. I already know. Fact check me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll do it's it. It's like a child. A peruse peruse is what a lawyer does with no. a document. A peruse is like what you do in the library and you're like, oh, this looks good. This looks good. I can't wait to be right here. This is so fun. Scrutinize. Wade through. Examine. Inspect. These are the mm. these are the synonyms for peruse. If this is one of the coolest words because everybody uses it wrong. I happen to have learned this a few years ago, so I like to shove it in the faces of people like you. Um, yeah, it's pretty uh pretty cool. What's an example sentence? <sighs> Please use uh, it. Basically, Here's okay, one. I believe you. I believe spent you. spent timeless hours in libraries perusing art history books and catalogs. Examine carefully or at length is the... Okay. It's it's fine. I feel everybody, defeated. You know, everybody's wrong sometimes. You're not wrong often. I'll give you that. I hey, am wrong in this you case. You want a drama? I am I wrong in this case. And that make my you whole feel? world is actually turned upside down. <laughs> That'll I'm, mess with you. I feel like I'm That's spinning mess with completely out of control right now. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to melt down. Okay, let's, is not, let's get this, this back is not on good. track. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to finish this episode. I oh, he's gonna, he's gonna walk out. Let's, <laughs> no. All right. So I here, demand you change the meaning of that word. <laughs> um, last episode we talked a little bit about me having some notes that would carry over this week. Yes, uh, I want to get into those. Okay. So I got some feedback from a friend of mine. He actually called me up and he said, "Hey." I really like the topic about 3D printing versus additive. Okay. And he's got kind of his own history that that he has gathered through his past experience at an OEM. And he said, here's what I think happened. Back, I don't know when, we'd have to look at, at the history. He's like, but a few years ago, this 3D printing idea was kind of Everyone's exposure was, it's going to be the next toaster oven. Everybody's going to have it, Mm -hmm. right? And we have actually had this discussion too. And it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Yeah. So when it didn't, 3D printing became obsolete. And they needed to create a differentiator, the OEMs. They needed to be taken more seriously. Like, this isn't the toaster oven. This is industrial. Yeah. This is different yeah. it's not just one of those things so that's when the additive they manufacturing they came to be we're at risk of having a barbie branded 3d printer and uh, that's going to devalue our brand so uh we got to come up with a different name yeah and they needed separation so here's what i did uh have you ever seen the the or used the google ngram viewer no. it, you can basically look up a word and see its usage over time. Okay. So I went back, I used this Ngram viewer. Ngram. Yeah. And I don't know if that's how everybody says it, but it's, okay. if you want to use it, it's, it's on Google. Google. Okay. Yes. And it will peruse documents for you and basically give you the written history where this word has been used. And it'll give me a graph. 
which is okay. really cool. Guess where the graph it flatlines, and then it what does what's one of the these. term? What's the term? Additive manufacturing. Okay. When did it spike? And it two thousand twelve. We're talking. It's almost straight up and down. I would guess two thousand twelve. Ooh. Okay, so that's where it really took off. And it started to ramp up around 2006, 2007. Okay, so earlier than that. Which, funny enough, coincides with my junior year of high school oh, when yeah. we got our first 3D printer. Yeah, that's that's right around the time period where you started to see 3D printing enter more mainstream. Yeah, we were, we were the first high school in Utah to have one. Wow. Pretty cool. Wow, so, a bunch of country kids getting their 3D good old printer. Los Angeles High School. <laughs> yep, and then... It took off in like 2012. Okay. It went just straight up. So it went through this baby ramp mm -hmm. at 2006, went straight up. Now the term 3D printing, tell me what you think it did when I pulled it up. What does the graph I, look like? I would guess that it is non-existent until about 1997. This one messed me up. This one messed me up a little. Have a look at this. Okay, so you see a spike around 1950s? Yeah. So I was super surprised by this, and I tried finding some of the documents where this was popping up, because here's what essentially happened. It peaked. It I hit a peak. Happened. 1948. 3D printing peaked in its usage almost, oh boy. What is it? I know what happened. What happened? Do you know? No, continue. Continue. I have a, I have a theory. Okay. I, I like this. All right. So we saw a big spike. It, basically, early 1900s were the first usages of this word. Now, here's what could have happened. 3D and then printing, since this is just looking through documents, could have just, there could have been some sort of follow-up to 3D. Yeah. And it might be seeing that. Yeah. Um, Oof, that could totally be it. Anyway, big spike in 1948. That's it. And then you think that's it? That's that's 100% it. Let me try something here. Live action. <gasps> My life just changed. That's definitely it. Because instead of third printing, it's read printing. You have first printing, second printing, mm -hmm. third printing. Okay. It's, it's not third, it's 3D. That's the way that they did it. Probably until 3D started entering the lexicon. And then they're like, oh, let's use third as three. So, yes, <laughs> this is what happened. But this led me down a wild goose chase. Still led you down a fruitful path. It, it was fruitful. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing. Well, let me just explain to you all what just happened. I put a hyphen in there between 3D and printing, okay. and it changed, and now the graphs almost look identical. Like you, okay. you could overlay them, and the timeline's the same right around 2006. It starts picking up, and then it goes straight up with additive manufacturing, the usage. Now, this past graph showed some usage of 3D printing uh, in the mid-1900s. And yeah. here, here's, Which, what, here's what I found. Okay. <clears throat> it's actually pretty neat. So... You brought up Autodesk earlier. Uh, I found this on uh, one of their websites. It's redshift.autodesk.com forward okay. slash history of 3D printing. Okay. It's actually pretty cool. So if you want kind of an overview of this, um, I found this pretty awesome. So let me read this to you. The first patent for a process called liquid metal recorder dates to the 1970s, but the idea is much older. So liquid the, metal recorder? Yeah, liquid okay. metal recorder. This, so this, is, that, this is the first I've heard of this. Yeah, so this could be like a welding okay. type of machine okay. uh, additive. And I love the way they start the article. What technology is 80 years old in theory, 40 years old in practice, and looks brand new? Believe it or not, it's 3D printing. So it, it had me pretty hooked Yeah, uh, from the very beginning. But there's this guy. You have, I want, I'm curious if you've heard of him. In 1945, a prescient short story... I had to look up what prescient means. Do you know what it means? It's, I've always pronounced it like prescient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't give you that. It's like now into, I, seeing I into the future. It's like seeing into the yes. future, right? Yes, exactly. 
So I, I'm sorry I messed with you. Your, uh, you your, actually I um, your I, you zeroed out my confidence. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked uh, for it though. I asked to be humbled. An impression story, short story by Murray Langster called Things Pass By. Uh, he describes the process of feeding magnetronic plastics, the stuff they make houses and ships out of nowadays, into this moving arm. I love how even plastic is a new thing. Oh, yeah. At this point. Yeah. It makes drawings in the air. Following uh, drawings, it scans with photo cells. But plastic comes out the end of the drawing arm and hardens as it comes. Uh, this was like science fiction yeah. back then. It's like the three doodler. Yeah. It's the it's the original idea of the three doodler. So I really like this. So article. that was 1940s? 1945 is when that book was wow. written. So I'm wondering if, you know, there are a couple documents out there that that yeah pop up the, there. The most commonly referenced is an article from New Scientist that was like in 1974 where a guy who would write like a satirical uh, segment mm -hmm. every issue was talking about a process that would resemble SLA, but it was total. It was it was a work of fiction, right? And that was like the '70s. So you're talking about 30 years sooner, earlier, earlier. Yes. Wow, I'm impressed. Now, one thing that came to mind when, when I saw that spike in the 1950s was mm -hmm. the invention of photolithography. Do you know that? <laughs> Why do you even ask at this point? When you see this look in my yeah. eye, where it's just like photolithography. You know by now. Photolithography is the process that they started to use to create printed circuit boards and semiconductors, layer by layer by layer where you would use a uh, photo curable resin and you create a mask and then that mask blocks the light and you cure it. And then you can build up circuit boards and semiconductors and it launched, it's the basic, it's how you build microchips. Photolithography was invented in what eventually became Army Research Labs in 1958, photolithography. Are you trying to you give me that look like I should fact check no, this? No, you don't have to. Don't bother. It's true. <laughs> so remember that time you told me you never uh, do a monologue? I have a monologue. While you have gone on several, on your first one, I was able to go find the YouTube of the week that I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> Found it. What was it? You. I'm not going to go there. You let's, were able let's... to find a whole YouTube thing? How long did that take you? Seconds. Yeah, that's not a monologue. You played me right there. Yeah, I did. Like a fiddle. Yeah, I did. Wow, you're good. <laughs> Dang, he's good. He used my own ego against me. Um, so let's get back on topic here. Yeah. What This got me down a path where it really got me thinking about the history. And I remember right. you and I have had conversations like way, way back when I started. And now I was wondering if you would kind of give us a brief overview because the fact that you remember this all, like the godfathers of 3D printing, can you tell us who they are, when about they came up, or should we just reference people to this? this well, up? we can talk a little bit about it. So we were talking about uh, that article in the 1970s, mm -hmm. early research into stereolithography type technology, or SLA type technology, started in the late 70s, early 80s. And it's largely credited to a man by the name of Hideo Kodama. Oh, you're good. You are and, incredible. And uh, he was working on some technology. And he was a lawyer. Yeah. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. Um, there were some issues with the patent. And he didn't, uh, he didn't actually complete the patent application process, right? And then there was a group, there was a French team that was also working it on it. It says, at least in this article, it says his research published in several papers and resulted in his own uh, November 1981 patent, but a complete lack of interest meant that it went nowhere. Mm, I don't, I don't know about that because if you, I mean, pat, if you patented it, to look it up. 
Yeah, but if you so that probably would have been like eighty one. That's exactly when it was, and that should have protected the technology, even if he didn't commercialize it. I don't know, and obviously we weren't there, so we're we're talking about secondhand, thirdhand information. We weren't even a a sparkle in our parents' eyes yet. Yeah, you don't want to know what I was. So I was um, about to talk about the French team that was working on it, and they they went through the patent process. There were some issues, and then Chuck Hole came in and swooped in and what largely recognized as the first patented 3D printing technology with stereolithography, which stereolithography drew its name from photolithography. So he started the company 3D Systems and released, uh, I think it was called the SLA-1 3D printer. Around that, so that's mid eighties. Gosh, you're good. At around that same time, I'm watching this. I'm kind of like going down the, this document yeah. in his because it's in chronological order. Yeah, and you're like hitting all high <laughs> points. So crazy. So around that same time, you had Carl Deckard working on an SLS, what eventually became selective laser sintering. He was at UT doing research there, and he eventually commercialized that under the name desktop uh it was dtm desktop machine desktop manu- desktop manufacturing desktop manufacturing which he eventually that company was acquired by 3d systems like in the early 90s i think somewhere in the 90s and then at the same time you had scott crump and his wife working on what eventually became known as fbm and commercialized under the stratasys name I think he filed for a patent in like 89. It was awarded in 92, I think. And then in the early 90s, he had Hans Langer, who started EOS and was a pioneer in uh, selective laser melting. So powder, powder bed fusion as we know it, or laser sintering as we know it. And that's kind of who existed until like the mid 90s. And then you had companies like mm, uh, Object, in the late in the late nineties, solid scape with wax printing. You had going into the early two thousands in Vision Tech with the DLP printing, and a lot of these names are names that we these company names are, are still around or or have merged or been acquired by each other. But the big ones, EOS, three D Systems, Stratasys, they go all the way back to the very beginning. Um, so then you. So then you have uh, the rep wrap. This is this is where I really want to get into because I is think, it well it's one of the things because it coincides the growth and kind of ex- just rep wrap's first blast onto the scene was right around the time yeah that we saw the spike in the usage of the terms yeah. additive manufacturing and three D printing. So that would probably be like two thousand six because two thousand five two thousand five and that's Close with Adrian Bauer. Yep. Boyer, Bauer? Yep. Yep. Which it's Boyer. Boyer, Boyer. But I'm sure you could say it either way. I actually couldn't remember if it was a W or a Y. It's W first, then Y. Oh, both. It's both. Yeah, Bauer. Bauer. Okay. Yeah, and that launches RepRap, which was a 3D printer that could hopefully create itself, right? Largely create this, its own structural components. Could this have been what Ben was talking about, my buddy, when he talked about this may have been what started the, the toaster idea. Yes. These are going to be everywhere. Yes. Definitely. That's, that's the origins of it for sure. Because at this point, you know, you had had printers now for almost 20 years. The prices had not come down in those 20 years. So they were, they were more expensive than they are today. And not anywhere near uh, approachable by your average person. And so RepRap was like, hey, we can build our own printers and for hundreds of dollars and we can, we can create plastic parts. And uh, a, good, a good resource for people who may have not seen it uh, for this RepRap story into the MakerBot story, into like the whole consumer-oriented printing is Print the Legend, that documentary. Have you seen that? Not yet. 
but you I, see, you need I to know watch it. it's on Netflix, right? It is. It was on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on Netflix. I had it in my watch later. Print the legend. It's it's good, but it's the story of basically how Bree Pettis became the richest man in all of three D printing <laughs> by uh, commercializing an open source project called RepRap and turning it into MakerBot, and then being bought out by Stratasys for four hundred million dollars. Four hundred million. Uh huh. My my my. Yeah. That's some that's some serious cheddar. That is. Now whether it was up, it was valued up to four hundred million, and I actually don't remember Some the details because he secured the bag. He's got the bag. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't actually. I don't even know what happened to him. Uh, I was. He was around for a while, and they kind of gave him special projects, like and, as a consultant. Uh, like within Stratasys slash MakerBot. But who knows? He's probably in the Bahamas now. <laughs> Living in a concrete printed house. So from there, I, I mean, I think the origin of 3D printing is pretty cool. I thought. Yeah. And I think largely we're still at the very big, be- we're still at the beginning of it. You know, people a uh, hundred years from, from now will be like, well, the history of 3D printing really started with the Go Additive podcast. But before that were some <laughs> minor pioneers in 3D printing. So let's talk about those people. Well, we are pioneers of our own, of our own type. Yeah. My family thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> I haven't even told my family about this. I know they wouldn't. One of, one of my family members found it. How? I think on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, yeah. I haven't posted it. I've never, po- I've never told anybody about this. Well, maybe, never it's, time, anything. maybe it's time we do. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't want it to get too famous. Well, our last video on YouTube didn't do so well. <laughs> I did all right. There's did literally right. dozens of views. <laughs> yeah. If you want we to actually had some Tyler and I, honestly, one of the best metrics that internally they're yeah. going to go by is our YouTube yeah. numbers. Write, write some bots, refresh that page a million times, jack up our views. Some print heads commented saying, hey, we listened to you on Spotify. Very nice comments, which... You should we talk should. about this and this. Yeah, we appreciate that. And we will take note of everything that you're curious about because we want to know what our listeners want. Yeah. And, you know, we appreciate the positive comments, but uh, we also appreciate recommendations. And, hey, I saw this I saw this news story. Can you guys talk yeah. a little bit about this? We, we love that. Yeah. If you, if you want to honor us, uh, use Peruse in an accurate uh you can thank Phrasing. me later for that, everybody, because I know that helped you. Now, here, just but here's the problem, though. Let's say oh we go out gosh. into the world and we use it correctly. Mm-hmm. All you're doing is you're inviting exactly what happened here. You're inviting people being like, mm, mm, you're using that word wrong. It's tough. It's a tough world we live in. Yeah. Just because everyone else understands it incorrectly, does that mean you should just fall in line? That's why, you know, it's just... It's hard. Well, we're getting to the end of this episode. We are. There's something sure. I want to talk about before okay. we leave, though. Okay. It's this oh, guy right here. Oh, yeah, some show and tell. So we've talked about this now for a few episodes, and uh, it looks like you're set up to do a demonstration. I am. Would you mind helping me? Mm, sure. I'm, so, I'm able and willing. All right. I want to... I do want to talk about it real quick. So okay. this is the brake line straightener. You're going to have to use the force. At. Use the force to like. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> so this is ASA. So speaking of our ASA material from the material minute brought to you by Juicy Filaments. That mm-hmm. isn't a real brand. <laughs> we, uh, I. Is our money real that we're getting paid? <laughs> no, 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 no money. Monopoly money. <laughs> this was really cool for me to print. Mostly because it worked super, super well. And I want to show you okay. how well it works. You, for our listeners, will have to describe it. And for those that are watching on YouTube, uh, they can see it. This may be one that you might have to, even if you listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your podcast uh, tool of choice, you may have to tune into YouTube just to see it. Yes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how this material comes. It's... 316 stainless steel um, 
and it's actually three sixteenths diameter. Okay. It's it's hollow tube, okay. and it comes wrapped up on a coil. Okay. These are your brake lines. These are brake for lines bronco. for my for pickup. Yep. For the old. Do you pick call a bronco a pickup? No. No. Okay. I don't know. That was confusing. Yeah, my bad. Okay. So if you look through there, you can actually see that they're the wheels. The profile of the wheels or the tires oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. are create a circular shape. Okay. And they're so these are basically guide rollers. And there's four sets of four. It's pretty cool. This will actually straighten the whole thing out. So I'm gonna plug this tube in that is currently um, curled. Yep. Right? And it emerges. Watch what comes out the other side. It takes a little bit of doing but look at that it's dead straight isn't that it insane it's dead straight so you can push it or pull it pulling it you actually bent it pulling it did i yeah a little bit it was straighter before yeah i keep bumping my thumb into this yeah look at that you need like a tpu pad on the front end to protect my thumb yeah it's dead look. straight how much should i push through go all the way until you hit the lens <laughs> how cool is that that is so cool so it's not perfect right it's got just the slightest bow to it yeah but like you mentioned before now i can take that puppy you can see there's just a little bow yeah and i can straighten it perfectly just by giving it that much that's wild isn't that cool it is so cool so that saved me tons and tons of hours yeah. because there's a lot of straight portions on and my it just truck. looks so much more professional so I'm basically a, a cheap professional because I was able to print a tool for low cost. This actually isn't solid either. Do you want to give it a feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels heavy, but there's metal in here. It's Most of the weight is from the washers and fasteners. So these are big bearings. shoulder bolts? They are not shoulder bolts. They're just a standard socket head, oh, flat top. They're so big. Head. Why are they so big? They're eight millimeter. The flat heads just make them Is that look big. I chose eight millimeter because the bearings are like a standard skateboard or rollerblade bearing or like a razor scooter yeah. bearing and they're just cheap. I bought oh, like that makes sense. 20 packs. That's why I thought they were shoulder bolts. Um, that makes sense. And so you had inspiration, which we talked about this, but this is your design. You designed it from scratch. Yeah. Which cool. for no other reason than just. So did you design any clearance? No clearance. No. So we is it, talked about. Is it straight to size? Yeah, so when you talk about pressure, I knew that the tires would deflect ultimately, and I wanted some pressure. So if this were oversized at all, I wanted those pressure dies, is essentially what they yeah. are, the guide rollers, to push into the material because it is material forming at the mm -hmm. end of the day. So that worked out. That's right. Without doing an FDA analysis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, why would you? That's I mean, what I was telling you last time. And you made fun of me for not, no, not no, understanding no, no, no. the forces. No, no, no. Okay. That's, we have it on video. <laughs> yeah. We have it on video. We do. Proof. The proof is in the pudding. Anyway, so that's a show and tell. We did the material minute. I do want to end this episode, unless you have anything additional to say, with the YouTube of the day. YouTube of the day. And because we saw a lot of autonomous vehicles this week, and that's kind of one of our themes. LiDAR popped into my head. Okay. I was trying to learn a little bit more about LiDAR, and I happened to find an article where this gentleman uses LiDAR 3D scanning mm. to create a 3D printed tool. You would love this video. I'm going to share it with you later okay. for his bandsaw. So he 3D scans his bandsaw using his phone. Yeah, using his phone and LiDAR and creates uh, a 3D print later for just a bracket. He, w he was doing some dust collection. Really? So cool. So his, it's not like a video scan, it's taking pictures and it'll automate when to take the pictures. And he Is talks it? about lighting. He talks about reflection. Don't he talks about how LiDAR struggles, which is important yeah. when you talk about autonomous vehicles, right? Yeah. If a shiny stop sign is there and it's too shiny, the LiDAR doesn't pick it up. Well, famously, so backup units. Famously, Tesla said, we're not using LiDAR. And they're like the sole company that I'm, that's kind of the story. I don't know, but they, they're like, we're not going to use LiDAR. Now, don't the new iPhones have LiDAR? Is that? Yeah. So that's 
I think a lot of new phones have the oh, okay. capability. So the the channel is called Need It, Make It. Okay. All one I word. Like that. Need it, make it. It's got about thirty thousand subscribers. It's really fun. This particular video title is Can You Three D Scan Tools with Your Phone Model and Print It. It's a long title. Not yeah. very catchy. Yeah. But fantastic video. I encourage you to go watch it. It's super fun. And it helped me learn a little bit how cool. LiDAR is used on our phones. That's interesting. Um, I'll share The it typical you. way of scanning with a phone was through photogrammetry. Yes. Which is less precise than LiDAR. Yeah. And you need good lighting, like really good yeah. lighting. There's actually some new tools for autofocus on cameras with LiDAR because it can, it can work in complete darkness where the a camera uses autofocus, it's actually analyzing the image and it's looking for contrast. But when it's low light, it struggles with that. Right. So LiDAR fixes that. LiDAR is, LiDAR is cool. And as, Very neat. as technology shrinks, you start to see it incorporated into new products, which is, which is awesome. Super fun. It's one of the reasons why photolithography was transformational. <laughs> the shrinking of electronics. <laughs> Way to bring that theme back in. Way yep. to tie it all together. <laughs> Got to do that. I don't well, have a YouTube of the day. That's all right. I think this episode was pretty jam-packed. Yeah. I discovered YouTube shorts. You barely discovered that. Yeah. They're just trying to be like Reels or TikToks, right? Like well, it's, it's so TikTok, TikTok overtook it. YouTube as the most visited website in the entire world. Or they took over Google. TikTok... More web traffic goes through TikTok websites now than all of Google. That's scary. It is scary because it means like that's billions and billions of hours wasted. Billions and billions and billions. All right. We're being told to wrap it up. So we will catch you guys next week. All right. See you later. Take care.